Cellular respiration is a very complex process, and when you're learning about it, it can be really hard to see where everything goes to and where everything comes from. That's what we're going to do in this video. I wanna step through the process of cellular respiration with you, and we'll account for every atom that goes in and every atom that comes out so you can see exactly what happens. I do wanna preface this by saying that if you're a Victorian VCE biology student, you really don't need to remember the number of NADH and FADH2 and even carbon dioxide and oxygen, it's been 20 years since VCAR required those numbers. The one exception to that is ATP. You absolutely need to know the number of ATP that are produced by each stage of cellular respiration. And by stage, of course, I'm referring to glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and electron transport. Let's just take a moment and look at where they happen. You certainly need to know that. Glycolysis takes place in the cytosol, not in the mitochondria. The Krebs cycle takes place in the matrix of the mitochondrion, that is right in the middle of the mitochondrion, and the electron transport chain takes place on the cristae, the folded invaginations of that, uh, that inner membrane of the mitochondrion. All right, let's start with glycolysis. The main input to glycolysis is glucose, C6H12O6, and the output, and that glucose is taken and broken into two pyruvate molecules. In fact, the name glycolysis means splitting sugar. I just want to pause for a moment and direct your attention to the way that I've formatted the formula for pyruvate. Notice how the hydrogen and oxygen are faded out. The reason I've done that is because if you're a Victorian VCE biology student, I don't think you need to remember the number of hydrogens and oxygens that are in pyruvate. At least I when I say I don't think you need to remember, what I mean is I don't think the exam will require that of you. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't learn it, it just means it probably isn't going to be required on the exam. But I do think you should know that there are three carbons in each pyruvate and that there are two pyruvates. I'm going to do that right throughout this video. Anything that's faded is something that I think you'll get away without memorizing. Uh, but because we're trying to take account of where everything goes to and where everything comes from, we obviously need to put them in so that we can follow that through. Anytime you take a big molecule and break it into two smaller molecules, some energy is going to be released. And in this case, a lot of that energy is used to take two ADP molecules and two inorganic phosphates and join them together to make two ATP molecules. Now, ATP is a coenzyme that has energy in it. Um, the, the addition of those phosphates to the ADP molecules means that ATP has more energy than ADP had. People often refer to ATP as the energy currency or the energy money of the cell because the cell can spend ATP to do any process in the cell that requires energy, maybe active transport or uh, perhaps protein synthesis, anything that requires energy, that ATP can be used for that purpose. There's another high energy molecule that's produced by glycolysis as well. It's also a coenzyme. Um, its name is NAD+, and NAD+, collects a hydrogen. That is, it gets reduced, is the term that we use, and it gets reduced to a molecule called NADH. Now again, notice that the two there is faded, because I just want to remind you, you probably don't need to remember that there are two of them. Not that it's unhelpful to remember it. Um, I won't point that out at every step, um, just reminding you of that here. All right, so we've added two NADH to the NADH pool and two ATP to the ATP pool. Now, if ATP is energy money, NADH is more like an energy gift card. It has value, but you can't just spend it anywhere. You can't use it, you know, if you've got an iTunes gift card, you can't, you can't buy petrol with it. You can't buy groceries with it. You can spend it in the Apple store or a few other select places, but, but that's all. And that's very much like what NADH is like. It can be spent in the electron transport chain and a few other select places, a few other select processes in a cell, but it can't be used for active transport or protein synthesis or, or other energy requiring processes the way that ATP can. Now, at this point, before we move on to talk about the Krebs cycle, we need to have a look at the numbers because that's the whole point of this video. And if you notice, all you know, the six carbons that were in the glucose have come out as 
pyruvate. We've got two, three carbon molecules, that's six. The six oxygens that went in as glucose, again, have come out in the pyruvate. So that, that makes sense. We've got two pyruvate molecules and each of them has three oxygens. But the hydrogen is a problem because we had 12 hydrogens go in as glucose, but we've only got eight coming out. Two pyruvates each with four hydrogens. So what happened to the other four hydrogens? Well, two of them, of course, are in the NADH. But what about the other two? You know, because we've got, we've got eight there in the pyruvate, we've got two in NADH, that's still only 10, but we had 12 go in. So the other two are unaccounted for. So at the moment, let's just say that those other two hydrogens must be there, I and mean, they're not gonna vanish, so they must still be there. They're coming out of the process of glycolysis. Let's just draw an arrow, and we'll put those two hydrogens there for the minute. We'll come back to them later. But let's turn our attention now to the Krebs cycle. The two pyruvate molecules that we had go into the Krebs cycle, and through a series of processes, they come out as carbon dioxide. And again, we've got a big molecule being broken down into smaller molecules, and that releases energy, enough energy to turn two more ADPs and inorganic phosphates into ATP, giving us so far two, four ATP in our ATP pool. We also make eight more NADH molecules. Now at this stage, everything looks at least as far as the hydrogens are concerned, pretty balanced, right? Because we had two pyruvate molecules going into the Krebs cycle, each of them with four hydrogens, that's eight hydrogens, and we've now just produced eight NADH, which accounts for those eight hydrogens that went into the Krebs cycle. But the Krebs cycle also produces another two coenzymes, which are called FAD. H2. So it takes two FAD molecules and in each case adds two hydrogens to them to give us two FADH2 molecules. That requires four more hydrogens. Right? So where do those four hydrogens come from? We had eight hydrogens going in, but we've got 12 coming out. So somehow there must be four extra hydrogens required. It doesn't really balance. So for the moment, let's just say going into the Krebs cycle, there must be another four hydrogens, right? Now, of course, two of those hydrogens could be the two hydrogens that came out of glycolysis, but that still leaves us two hydrogens short. So at this stage, we're going to have to O the cell two hydrogens. We're gonna write an IOU and just pin it there to say to the cell, we've used two hydrogens, we're gonna to have to pay them back later, and, and we'll come back to that in a moment, okay? So we, we O the cell two hydrogens at this stage. In addition to the hydrogens, we've also got a little bit of a problem with the oxygen. Because if you have a look at, again, the pyruvate, we had two pyruvate molecules going into the Krebs cycle, and each of those had three oxygens. That's a total of six oxygens. But we've got six carbon dioxide molecules coming out, and they've both got, I mean, each of those six carbon dioxides have two oxygens on them. That's 12. So we've got six oxygens going in and 12 coming out. That, that means somehow an extra six oxygens have appeared. So that's a little bit of a problem too. There must be six oxygens going in there somewhere. Where from? Well, again, let's borrow those from the cell. We'll write the cell an IOU for those extra six oxygens, okay? And we'll just leave that there for the moment. Let's move on and look at the electron transport chain. Those FADH2 molecules and NADH molecules, the whole reason for having them is remember they're like an energy gift card. They have value, um, but only in the electron transport chain. And so they move now to the cristae, to that folded inner membrane of the mitochondrion. And the electrons that are holding the hydrogens to those coenzymes are taken into the electron transport chain and the hydrogens are released. So let's have those going in and what comes out are two oxidized FAD molecules and 10 oxidized NAD plus molecules. That is the, the FAD H2 and the NADH have lost their hydrogens. That's what we mean by saying that they're oxidized. And of course the 14 hydrogens that were attached to those coenzymes are released as hydrogens as well. For doing that, 
You know, the electrons that, that were in those molecules are then passed from one protein to the next to the next along the electron transport chain. And that process gives us 26 or 28 ATP, depending on the cell type. All right, so now we have a total of 30 or 32 ATP in the ATP pool. Now those 14 electrons that were carried into the electron transport chain by NADH and FADH2 will only move along the electron transport chain as long as there's something there at the end to accept the electrons. And that final electron acceptor is oxygen. And this is why six oxygen molecules go into the electron transport chain. Together with those, those six oxygen molecules, some hydrogen needs to go in as well because oxygen and hydrogen combine to form water. And of course, if you look at a water molecule, each water molecule has one oxygen and two hydrogens. So in order to do that, we need 12 hydrogens. So 12 hydrogens need to go in to meet the oxygen. Um, but when you have a look at this, I mean, that makes sense. This is where water comes out of the electron transport chain. Okay, so now we've, we've seen why oxygen is needed for cellular respiration and why water is produced by cellular respiration. But if you look at the numbers, again, things don't really quite add up the way we think that they would, do we? Because um, if you have a look at this, remember we had 14 hydrogens that were released by NADH and FADH2, but only 12 hydrogens are needed to make those six water molecules. And even worse, if you have a look at the oxygens, in those waters that come out of the electron transport chain, there are only six oxygens, because six water molecules and they've each got one oxygen. But six oxygen molecules went in. So what happened to the other six oxygen atoms, right? We had six oxygen molecules go in and each of those oxygen molecules has two oxygen atoms, but we only needed half of those to make those six water molecules. So we've got some leftovers. We've got two leftover hydrogens and we've got six leftover oxygens at the end of the electron transport chain. Well, what happens to those? Well, I hope you can see it. Remember earlier in the process when we were looking at the Krebs cycle, we wrote two IOUs to the cell. We said we were going to have to pay back six oxygen atoms to the cell because we had to borrow six oxygens from the cell in order to do the Krebs cycle. So we can pay those back. And we had to pay two hydrogens back right back at the beginning of the Krebs cycle as well. So by the time we get to the end of the electron transport, every atom right down to the last hydrogen ion has been accounted for. It's perfectly balanced as all things should be.